presenting to you uh, our uh, deputy general counsel from the national office. Uh, I know her to be a brilliant young lady. Uh, she has connections with us. She's taking fun with the fit. Uh, but uh, she is, I, want, I, I would have loved to have had every legal redress chair in the state. I know I don't have that. Would have loved to have every one of the presidents. I know I don't have that. But as I told you yesterday, from your unit, you need to take back what you hear. Uh, so uh, at that, uh, Miss Janet Lord, I said it right there. He sure did. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon or good morning. Good, good morning. Good morning. And uh, it, it is indeed a pleasure to be here. Thank you, President Sweetlove. Um, as President Sweetlove has mentioned, um, I have a dear connection to the great state of Tennessee, particularly the city, Nashville, because my heart and my money are in Nashville. All right. In the form of my son who's attending this. So it is indeed a pleasure to be here. So this is going to be not as much a presentation as a, as a uh, conversation. I'd like to give you an overview about the Office of General Counsel and we'll talk to you a little bit about uh, legal redress co um, the committees and just what, just to give a refresher, I'm sure a lot of people already know this, but then I'd like to open it up. It's not often, I think, that you get a chance to talk to someone from OGC and you, you may have some questions about litigation. So, is it okay if I sit? Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning, good morning. So, the Office of General Counsel um, is headed by Bradford Barrett. And in addition to myself, there's Anson Asaka, who's the Associate General Counsel, Keila Crane, the Assistant General Counsel, and Lanita Ross. Now, what do we do in the Office of General Counsel? Does anyone know what, you know, what do we do? Okay, we give advice on legal issues, okay, anything else? So I think a lot of times when I meet people in the association, they don't necessarily have a clear vision of what it is we do, and so I'd like to, uh, to work on work and, um, clarifying some things. So as you're right, we, we give advice. Um, we litigate affirmative civil rights actions. Now, how many of you know that National has just filed a lawsuit against Donald Trump because of his rescission of the DACA program? Does anyone know that? Okay. Family email, you gotta reach email. Yeah, I know something else you guys do. Okay, uh, sir. A few, few years ago, I was sued because uh, some people in the community accused me of buying a bus using fe uh, federal funds to get to conduct business. And general counsel called me and asked me that I needed any help. It was because the state had been keeping them abreast of the things that I was doing. So they were there for me if I needed them. And believe it or not, they partnered with our branch to pay for the lawyer that did represent me. So that's the kind of thing I know that you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we work with state conferences, units, and branches on requests for litigation. I do a lot of that. I get a lot of requests for litigation. Um, we work with members seeking redress. We make determinations regarding direct action requests, and we give daily legal advice to the association. Um, sir? Okay. Um, we litigate affirmative civil rights actions. So as I discussed previously, our lawsuit against um, Donald J. Trump, um, yes, uh, or, or, as he may be known as number 45, um, we uh, just filed a lawsuit on behalf of um, those who have been affected by the DACA decision. And that's the NAACP National that has brought this lawsuit. And we are the, um, the lead plaintiff. And, um, I'm happy to say, although it's not official yet, that the American Federation of Teachers um, will be joining us in that lawsuit. So we anticipate that others will join us. So um, Keela Crane, who is our associate um, general counsel, has referred to us also as a two-headed monster. <laughs> so I'm not sure I like that characterization, but in addition to doing civil rights work, we do corporate work. So we ensure all contracts involved with NAACP are in the best um, interest of the association. 
we protect the NAACP for it. Um, so we have a lot of intellectual property issues. And that's very important because a lot of people who are not affiliated with us use our brand. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they use it for um, bad reasons. And even if they're using it for good reasons, um, it's our brand. And right. we get the right to say how we want it to be used. We also deal with real estate issues. There is, as you know, property owned by the association. And we deal with insurance issues. So with civil rights, but we're also corporate. So ergo the two-headed monster. Okay, just in case you all don't know the address of um, the Office of General Counsel, because of the convention, um, due to convention, people ask me, what's your address? So I'm gonna give it to you. It is 4805 Mount Hope Drive, Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. And our general phone number, if you all need to reach us, is 410 580 5790. It might be dangerous to put all that out there. So we, we try our best mm -hmm. to, uh, and, and, I, and I'll ask that you share a little bit about that. We try our best to keep our, uh, our, our whole conference informed. Right. Uh, and because right. we believe in informed members are, are members that can go out and do work. But we still Absolutely. have. We still have some folks that come to training and everything else and still go and do crazy things. But, but one of the things, and, and let me say this to you guys in front of Dan, one of the things we try to make sure we do is, is be that liaison to work with the unit and try to make sure that all everything possible with conflicts that we can sell them in Tennessee. Right. So we don't take up your time right. as the national office. So right. what, what happens to so much of your time that you're not saying is you have spent, you spend them uh, uh, cutting down uh, crazy conflicts between NAACP members. Right. And that doesn't make any sense. And I, you know, what I always say to us is the fight is out there, not in here, you know. So, so that's what they spend so much of their time doing. Way more than we thought you could do. Right, President Sweetlove. I couldn't have said it any better than President Sweetlove. Um, we are always happy to help, but you need to start at the state level first. You must start at the state level first. Um, I think I saw a hand up, sir. You said 410-580. Mm -hmm. Again, with a caveat, as, as um, President Sweetlove has said, you start local, state, level, and before they come to us. Okay? Does, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it was a good problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's typically, yeah, that's typically what's done, and oftentimes, when things are sent to me, I send them back. Right. To the state. Right. So, just so you know. So, but for I, folks that don't know, if you send it to her, she's gonna send it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, there's no way to get around it. Yeah. 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 that is what I do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That is what yeah. I do. Yeah. Did I see yeah. it? another hand? Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the redress committee. So each state conferencing unit should appoint a legal redress committee and attempt to locate at least one attorney to serve on this committee. Are there any members um, of the redress committee here? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, no, those are local, man. Those are local. That's not the state. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I, neither one of my main folks, uh, neither uh, Walter Cersei or uh, uh, Latasha Dexter could be here today. So neither one of my chairs are not here. Okay. Right. right. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Can, every, can everyone hear what this gentleman said? No, ma'am. Could you stand? He's a brand new president. Okay. He's a okay. good president. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Legal redress, according to the bylaws, is one of our standing committees. And you have to have at least three people on that committee to be the chair. And, and as a president, I'm chair of that committee. Uh, but one of the things we do preach is send everything to the state level and because of the sweet love, you know, it needs to go up and down. You know, up. So some of the things that uh, the, the committee um, is involved in supervising litigation, 
Um, and you're going to hear me say this word a lot, investigate. So uh, the committee investigates all cases reported to it, um, informs the national office and the branch, and very importantly, does not give legal advice. Amen. So I think the does not give legal advice. And uh, when I just started, I, I just started at, at the association about six months ago. It's been six wonderful months. But one of the things that, um, or the issues that came across my desk was a gentleman who called me to say that he had received advice um, from the committee um, that not just him, but uh, he and uh, about two or three other people received advice that caused them to lose their homes, that their homes would be for, that were foreclosed on. So um, happily, um, I was able to get to the bottom of it, and they, they did not give advice. Um, and there was one person that knew someone in the committee who may have made an offhanded remark, an offhand remark. And so we're able to squash that. But that just should show you um, the dangers of, of that, because that could have been a lawsuit. And even though ultimately they would not have won that lawsuit, we don't want to tie up the association right. money in fighting this and lawsuit. Resource. So exactly. So we do not want to give advice. Say that again, Danny. Say it. Say it again. <laughs> as as President Sweetlove uh, has said so eloquently, um, we we don't give legal advice. We 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 we, we don't. And that's the last sentence in your Right, 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 right. Yes, ma'am. Whether or not three persons on the committee can make functions, um, when I don't say big advice, but can they make some kind of statements? Typically, you want to you want to comply with all the procedural requirements, and there should be you know three persons of the committee. I mean, you you can listen, and you know in that in, in that case in that scenario, I would advise you to call OGC, and then we can we can get involved in, in, in determining what, what you should do. But um, my advice always is to try as much as you can to follow the procedural requirements. So, and, and, and let's, let's go this way again, Janice. Now, there can be more right. than three. Right. But there must be three. There must be at least three. Yeah. There can be more than three. That's correct. But there must be at least three. You know, the director, they're not on the committee. Can they listen in? We can't hear the question. Yeah, I'm going to ask that if you have questions, just come on up and use the microphone. Because it's just, it's, or I'll meet you. Well, I think I can speak loud. Okay. If you don't have three people, can the, can the executive director sit in? You know, I am not one? certain of, 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 of the answer to that. Um, I do believe it needs to be three people. I don't think the executive person can sit in, but can you if, if I can, I'm happy to get back to you on, on that, but I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. The vice president and the secretary, by virtue of their position, they have to move all the city. Right. Okay, so when people come into the office, uh, because I am the executive director of the Memphis branch, and I know a lot of a lot of um, branches do not have executive directors. So when people come in and make a complaint, is it okay for me to listen to their complaint? And then what I do is I get with the head of my legal redress right. for me, mm -hmm. and we go over mm -hmm. the complaint together. Right. And he writes down information. Absolutely. Okay. Right. We are doing you're, it. You're doing right thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Did, did, every, did everyone hear that question? So those complaints are supposed to be submitted in writing. Right. They are, yes. yes. They are submitted yes. in writing. Yes. Okay. But, but let, let me say this. Let me say this. When you've got an office, and Lord, how well we know, so I'm thank you, so thankful to have one. But when you've got an office, you get folks showing up out of the Wahoo all the time uh, to, to uh, register complaints. That's what, the dog, that's what they think you're supposed to do. They don't think that ACP does anything else but take complaints. So you, you get people. And, and the real thing is you get a lot of people that are really not even to able, not, not hardly able to articulate what their complaint is. And you've got to basically sort of help them 
with, with the writing and the finance. So mm -hmm. you, you get that. Yes. Uh, uh, um, mm -hmm. Audrey is from my branch, and she knows one of the things we stopped doing years ago, we didn't let folks come to the branch mm -hmm. and register no complaint in the branch. So they'll take up your whole meeting. Mm -hmm. So don't allow that. Make sure you don't allow that. Uh, if somebody shows up, allow uh, the legal redress person or the secretary or somebody to go outside in another place with them to get the plain complaint formulated. Mm -hmm. And don't don't allow that. Don't allow it to come before your general membership. Now, you know, as a matter of fact, if, if somebody come in and start doing that, you need you need to ask them to leave and, and try to do it because they'll take up all of your needs. That's that's correct. Um, is there another question? Well, I'm the membership chair for the Bowler branch. I got a hard job trying to get the membership money. Mm -hmm. But I get legal regret calls. I got one other night, and I would not pay it. I told them I don't handle that. I write membership. And my husband said, are they a member? And I said, you ask that. You probably need your head examined. I said, most people that ask for help from the government system are not members. Right. That's true. And so That's true. I forward them to our legal regret person. Did everyone hear what she said? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody didn't hear me. I said, I write, I write membership for the Bible branch. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a call about a matter. And I told them I don't handle that, so I forward them to my legal redress person. Oh. And my husband asked, well, they a member. And I said, you need your head examined if you thought they were members. <laughs> because people that want help from the NAACP. <laughs> are normally not them. Amen. That's correct. So we're taking complaints. We're looking at what really happened. What's the other side's story? And importantly, did a violation of law occur? Is it a civil rights violation? Will litigation be beneficial? And have you attempted to resolve with this negotiation? Now, um, I, um, I had spoken to um, a member who said, someone had come into the branch and said, that, that uh, he believed he was being discriminated against because they kept turning off his, his light. He says because he's black. So, okay, so what, 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 do, what do we do? We investigate. And that's a simple, a simple example, but it's important to say you can't just take the word of the complainant, right. that you have to dig deeper. So right. that's, a, that's a simple example. And the and, and other thing, I, I, you guys remember, I used one of our legal redress chairs was, was Linda Sesson Taylor. And one thing she used to always tell me, Dean, everything that's wrong is not illegal. So we got to also remember, right. sometimes things might be wrong in our eyesight, but they are not illegal. Right. So we, we got to look at legality. Okay. The other thing is we don't do criminal stuff, guys. Remember now, we don't do criminal stuff. I don't care if it's your secretary, Son, that just happened to get stopped. We don't do that because this is not about criminal lawyers in the world. People call this stuff that's going on. That's, that's correct, sir. Yes, ma'am. You raised an important issue, and there was a question that I had for you. Here's, here's, here's our situation now in Chapter 2. We have a group of employees that work for a major corporation. I can't hear you back here. Maybe you should come up. I think you're soft spoken like I am. Okay, so we have a group of employees, and they have some complaints about being a hostile person. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, now I do employment discrimination at TVA. That's in the, that's in the public sector. Now, now we're, we're talking about a private sector corporation because they have come in with complaints. We're in the process of doing our own investigation before we contact the corporation, right? So here's my question to you. I, I was looking through the resource manual that's available online, and there are no sample letters to use to contact the corporation to request their cooperation in a preliminary investigation to determine whether we want to pursue the issues and come to some type of voluntary resolution. Are there any materials that you have that would give us examples of how to contact a corporate entity and request assistance 
in resolving resolving allegations of discrimination. Actually, you sound articulate enough yourself that you ought to be able to do the last. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is an excellent question, sir. And I'm happy to report that we are working on a legal redress manual, which should come out in October. We were hoping to get it um, by September, but that didn't quite work. But it should be out in um, October. And also, if you, um, afterwards, we can, we'll speak. We'll, afterwards, we'll speak. If, if you need this before October, I'll give you my number and you can call me and we can talk about that. But I'm just, just, so, just so you know, we will, we will have the legal redress manual and that's gonna be disseminated in October, but that's an excellent question. And I didn't pay you to ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, are there any other questions? The other thing, let, let, me, let me offer the, uh, the uh, expertise of the state office. If, if you are needing assistance with something like that, uh, you can email us, uh, uh, whatever, and uh, we'll have you put that together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, ma'am? I, I just want to, I'm going back to with uh, President Sweetler, the example she gave before ge the gentleman asked his question. It was a perfect example, but I wanted to make a distinction. If the, it's the son of the president of the sister, I mean, whatever, and stop by the police, and that person feels that they were being discriminated against by uh, what, uh, driving high black, that can be reported to the office. Right. But if the person is guilty of um, being involved in an accident and is looking for an attorney, to that the NWC cannot do that. Right. That, 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 is, that, that's a, that that's absolutely right, ma'am. And actually, I have with me, and I may not have enough, I, I have someone in my hotel room, I think, just um, a uh, blue, little blue pamphlet about what to do when you're stopped by the police. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, this, is, this, is for, this is for you. Oh, yes, thank you. And I can get you some more if we run out, which I think we might um, after this, and I'll make sure to get it to everyone. So the Legal Redress Committee should develop relationships. It's advisable to develop relationships with the legal community. For example, a pro bono partnership program of our association's law firms. The case that I just spoke to you about, uh, that National Guard against President Trump, we're being represented by one of the largest firms in the country, pro bono. Pro bono. So it's really important to have those relationships. Um, prior to coming to the NAACP, I worked and lived in Cleveland, Ohio. And the Black Bar Association there is called the Norman S. Minor Bar Association, and they had a very, they had and have a very strong uh, relationship with the NAACP, and there are many attorneys there that have helped um, the NAACP in Cleveland um, on a pro bono basis. So it's very important um, to, if you can, if at all possible, to get attorneys who believe in the mission and who will do the work for free. That's a lovely thing. Uh, but without you know, skipping over law firms, there are some law firms, as I said before, who would help, and uh, in addition to the, um, to the Black Bar Association. Um, how many of you um, are involved with, at all in any bar associations? We work with Moody here, mm -hmm. and then a couple of others. So, uh, we've got, and our folks on our legal Wonderful, that's wonderful. 
And actually, um, in my other life, I practiced law with a woman named Joycelyn Stevenson, who is now in Tennessee, and she's really? the first African-American um, uh, head of a bar association. So her name is Joycelyn Stevenson. She's a good sister. She's someone that you all should get to know because she's in charge of not just the Black Bar Association, but the entire Bar Association for the state of Tennessee. No, and she's a she's S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N. Joycelyn Stevenson. She's in Nashville. She's in Nashville. And if y'all can't get in touch with her, y'all can get in touch with me. She's a friend, so I'll make sure I, I reach out to her. I see a hand, sir. Question. Are there also some uh, universities, schools, uh, law schools, that will also do some pro bono work in certain areas? Absolutely, sir. That's a great, that's, that's a great point. We have some litigation now in the state of Illinois where we are suing the city of Chicago for a systematic abuse of police um, and the treatment of people of color. And the people that are helping us is the University of Chicago's Law Clinic as well as Northwestern's Law Clinic. So absolutely, uh, that is a great resource to have. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so sometimes we have the situation where people come in as, 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 as complainants. But they, oh. I'll wait until you finish and then I'll, I'll ask the question. No, ma'am, it's okay. Oh, I would like to know, they have, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where, uh, in the town that I'm from, they have this, I don't know whether they're doing it everywhere or not. They have this uh, rule now with the employee, if a person is, they have written out a complaint or something, then they come to the NAACP, reread, and they go, uh, and you go with them to get, uh, when they go to their uh, interview about the complaint, you cannot go in there with them anymore. You can sit outside and wait, and uh, then they come out and tell you what happened, and they, they ask them for a decision right then, or they find them, or, or they uh, usually lay them off, and then tell them they're fired later on. So before, we have always been able to go in there with them, and so, just for uh, support. And then when they come out, they discuss it and we go over it, but we don't make a decision for them. We do give suggestions though, but not uh, tell them what to do. But they do not want anyone in there with them at all. Is that legal? Yes, and, and um, can, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so are you talking about the actual private company? Or are you yeah. talking about yeah. the EEOC? Private company. Private company, private company. Private company. yes. That is absolutely legal. A private corporation has, they have the, the, it's their authority or their discretion as to who will come in. And I used to um, represent some companies, um, again, in a, prior, in a prior life. And typically, and I'm surprised if they, they would let someone from the NAACP come into, come into a meeting because that's considered an internal uh, corporate matter. So, they have the absolute right to do that. Um, you can, at, at times, ask a request, but it's up to their dis discretion. Some companies will let you do that, right. but it's, they're, what, the ones that refuse, are, it's not illegal. Oh, okay. And answer that question, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but ma'am, you shouldn't um, give up trying in terms of, because some some corporations will say, okay, you can bring a representative in with you. Oh, okay. But they're nervous about us sitting in at any meeting. Right. Because they know, we if we don't like it. what we hear, right. we're about to sue. Right. right. Or we could sue. Right. So from their perspective, they are very nervous. But in, in, in any event, some corporations will let you, but it's up to them. It's, it's their discretion. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Sir? But you can sit in on county or state uh, well, you, that, that depends, you can, I, th I think yeah. you can do it, I was yeah. saying that depends, I'm thinking in some, uh, for example, um, in Cleveland there is a, a commission, it's, I'm trying to think the name of the commission, but they deal with um, internal complaints of city employees. Civil service? 
it's 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 not the solicitors. It'll, it'll come to me. It's a separate it's a separate um, um, a separate group. But in any event, they typically don't allow out unless you have an attorney with you. If, if you're an attorney, you can come in, but they consider that to be internal also. But that 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 has to do with it's their employees. Maybe that's a distinction. I have an, an employee who was her job was done away with, but they do allow her to have a peer review type situation to talk about it. And uh, she feels that she was let go because of her age, you know, thirty something years there. So she's going to have this meeting with them, and she asks if I would step in with her uh, in that meeting. So. Uh, they may turn me away. I don't know that she knows that, but we will try. Yeah, they may they may turn you away, and it's likely that that or they, they will. <laughs> but if, if they but even if they turn you away, you can prepare her before for that meeting, um, prep her for the meeting, and afterwards just get her. You know, she they will allow you to bring in um, you know pen and paper. She can write down every single thing that they say. And when she comes back to you, then you guys can strategize. So sometimes, I mean, even if you're in the meeting, a lot of times they won't let you talk. Right. You're just sitting there anyway. Right. So if you prep if you prep her as to what it is that she needs to say, and you tell her you write down everything that they say, right. then it's it's sometimes that's it's it's not as good as you being there. But um, it's, it, it's a good substitute. Um, one of the things I do want to caution that in some, some states, people try to record these meetings. And in some states, that's illegal. Now, there, there are places um, like Ohio is a one-party consent uh, state, which essentially means that as long as one party knows what's going on, it's fine. So if I'm recording, I know I'm recording, so it's OK. Uh, yeah. Well, I did not realize that, but other states, that's not the case. So I want to caution anyone to try to tell people to record things because you don't want to do something that ultimately um, will subject them to illegal um, well, prosecution. I don't know anyone would prosecute them, but in some states, it's illegal. But they can sit there and they can write to their heart's content. And you can ask them to slow down so that the talking don't wait, let me let me record this. Mm -hmm. And and that in itself makes them nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it is important that you have a record of what they say. Sir? Sometimes the corporation just knows, an organization just knows the you know, the C D just provide an oversight, that kind of gets the attention out it of does. It, it absolutely does. Uh, yeah. for me, for me, for me, for me. Uh, there's a public written record that's excellent. The name NAACP carries a lot of power, a lot of power, and a lot of times when companies hear the words NAACP, they start talking about settling. Yeah. So they might not let y'all in, but they might say, is it worth the fight? And so I, I definitely think it is important, and I hope that there's nothing that I've said to dissuade people from engaging in, in, in trying to negotiate or trying to assist people, assist the com complainants. It's just that a lot of companies are not going to let y'all sit in on those meetings. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any questions? Yes, evidence. Okay. So here are some of the do's and the don'ts. And, 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 and as always in life, there's, there are no absolutes. But some of the do's are if you get documents, it is always best to accept copies, not the original. Don't take the complainant's original document. And if that's all they have, just see if you can get a copy of it, but don't, don't take the originals. Act promptly. This is very important. Yeah. Um, particularly when you're dealing with situations where it might be a widespread discrimination, um, 
sitting on something um, can cause their, their legal deadlines, their things that are important, procedural requirements that need to be taken into account and waiting. I know everyone is busy, but it is important um, to act very promptly. Um, determine if the complaint has merit. How would one do that? Any thoughts about that? Right, right. That that's correct. But, um, so, 
I think you may also be talking about union employees where they have the collective bargaining, or are you just talking about the handbook? Oh, no. It's the handbook. It's the handbook. Okay. 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 And, and also, the EEOC will, if you are a union employee, they will, you have to exhaust the administrative um, remedies before you go into them. So you have to, you know, you have to grieve, you have to look at the grievance procedure if, if, if you're dealing with union employees. I would say that in some cases, even if you feel that the person is wrong, but if you can find that there has been disparate treatment for someone else is wrong, and they were not uh, penalized or punished, you should still proceed on. Right. Mm -hmm. and there are some templates out there to uh, for investigation. To it's a it's a fact sheet to help you guide yourself along the way to make sure that you have not missed any steps that will really help you present your case in a stronger, proper way. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. And the only thing I would add to that, you know, we are a right to work state. Mm -hmm. and <coughs> a lot of Did everyone hear this very important point this gentleman said? Could you repeat that, sir? I'm not sure they heard you. That Tennessee, like many other states now, are a right to work state. They normally can hire and fire you at will. Right. As long as it's not discrimination. Right. And if that is, you think is the case, the burden is on you. Right. Uh, and, and you guys know that that's one of the issues that every time when we go to the Hill, or legislate down on the Hill, we've got that we are against that, against the Hill uh, the at the will clause and that you know that we want to seek legislation to get rid of that and you know and that that's the kind of thing that we, we come up we get all these governmental gubernatorial and congressional candidates we all be saying that same kind of thing to them also and and you know we all we are i don't want to say the union busters but yeah we are because you know we had uh, senators that got in the way of the election in, in, uh, in Volkswagen. So uh, that means that we have to be persistent. So where there is an opportunity for you being a union employee, I, I want to tell you because I worked for a corporation and worked in HR for years, and I have developed policy manuals. They are developed for the employer, yeah. and not the employee. She's absolutely right. So you, you need, you know, so where, if, wherever it's possible, that you can be part of a union, a part of a bargaining agreement, where somebody else is speaking for you because you can think they love you to death. But now don't, uh, you know, just don't get on the wrong side. Or don't get hurt. Uh, don't become a liability. Because all of a sudden you fall out of faith. Mm -hmm. That's correct. President Sweet Love is very correct. Um, even though, you know, you're dealing with a, an at-will situation, still can't discriminate. Right. So a lot of times companies say, well, we're at, at will employees. Employers, rather, it's at will. That's true, but even in an at will state, you cannot discriminate. And so when, when you hear the word at will, what's your counter? No discrimination. No discrimination. No discrimination. Yeah. So that, at will, is, is it, it, it's a nice sort of, um, for employers to point to, it's a nice catchphrase for them to, to point to. Doesn't matter. Y'all still can't discriminate. Right. Oh, no. One of the important dues is before any lawsuit, you have to get approval from the NAACP general counsel right. and president and CEO. Right. So that's that's very important. So one thing, one request I would make um, as someone who works in OGC is that when you give us this litigation request, you give us a little bit of time. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a request on a Monday, and the suit is supposed to be filed on a Tuesday. So, and I know there's sometimes a situation where it's a terror or a temporary restraining order and things move fast, no problem, we know. And even when I get in that situation, we do our best to accommodate. But I just think it's better because you want us to do our due diligence. You want us to be able to research the law, make sure that the law that you're attorney that you're working with is correct, because a lot of times, you know, the, the flip side about filing um, complaints or filing a lawsuit is that if you lose, we might be liable right. for attorney's fees. Right. So I just ask that you just give us time. You know, we will work with you, but um, I'm sure no one here would, you know, give us 
our litigation request, you know, that's due the day before it, the lawsuit. But just in case y'all know someone who would do that, if you could pass the word. President Skipa. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I, we always talk about uh, if you got a situation in your uh, branch or in your area that you think might become explosive to the point that you want to do direct action. Well, the same thing is if you've got something that's going on in your area where you feel like at some point you might want to do litigation, if you, if you will do as we ask you to do anyway, if you will send us uh, uh, updates on what's going on, we will forward that uh, directly to the national office. So when, when, when Brother Williams out of Lewisburg get ready now to file that suit, guess what, your council already has that information because we passed it up. So we don't, we don't just keep in our files what you send us about your activities. We send that up so that there's already some background. And the other thing is, you know, you got to send it by us because the first thing they're going to call and ask, what do we know about it? Mm -hmm. So we need to know what's going on so that we can say, yes, that's been going on, ongoing. They have done the work. Uh, yes, they need the support. Thank you, President Sweetland. That is, that is an excellent point. Um, particularly, I can give an example in the um, Illinois case, in the Chicago case, where we were contacted by one of the branches. We then contacted the state conference and the state president to see what um, the position was. And everyone signed on, but it's good that one hand knows what the other hand is doing right. before it gets to general counsel. Because we're, we're, we're not going to skip over anything. We're going to come back and say, what, what, what's, what's going on? We're not going to. You can't bypass you know, um, state president just to go straight to um, OGC. You could do it, but we're going we're, we're gonna to then go back and say, OK, here we are. What's going on? Um, so what do you all know about why, what cases OGC decides to, to approve? What, what do we look at? And these are things that you guys should look at, too. What do you look at in determining um, whether to um, take a case? We already talked about the fact that the case will have merit. Is there anything else that we will look at? I would say cases that are uh, precedent setting, uh, cases that have not been heard in the court, because those cases that have been heard, you can use that as, your lawyer can use that as a argument tool. Case Very good point. Anything else? Yes. Sir? Yeah, you would want to look at its impact. In other words, Absolutely. how many people will Absolutely. be affected by it. If it's a housing case, and there are a lot of people that are experiencing these same problems in the housing, public housing, if it's employment, you want to look at how many people will be potentially impacted and how much good you can do by expanding resources and litigation. Absolutely, and that's the point that I, I really want to underscore, that we're looking at widespread application. A case might have merit, but if it only benefits an individual, it's really not what the association's about. We're about benefiting Thank you. Overall, benefiting you know, people of color. That's that's what we're looking for. Yeah, a, a class action. That's correct. Or even if it's a single, if it's a, um, it's unusual, but we may have a situation where it's a single plaintiff, but that law will create precedent, as was discussed previously, precedent that would be widespread, or a situation where it it reflects a pattern of practice of a type of discrimination that's been done. But typically, we, we're looking at widespread application. Um, does that make sense? You're looking at me like, are you, OK, I want to make sure. Not Yes, they do. <coughs> they do. So I don't have that much more time left, and I have a lot of other stuff. But um, yeah, I'm just going to breeze through. Sir? You got until no, she told me. She told me eleven, actually. What time is it, y'all? Is this eleven thirty? Oh, no, no, you. Uh, oh, oh, I'm okay. You're on. Uh, you're on Eastern time. We on Central. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you got thirty minutes. Okay, got thirty minutes. Okay. All right. We're good. And you might, Thank you. You might get to it, but my question was about uh, redistricting as we come up on the next year's election. I 
I, I do. Can everyone hear the question? Hear the question? The question was on redistricting. So we are currently Office of General Counsel working with um, Yale Law School, and they have a they have a law clinic there on that issue. And what we're going to be doing is working with them. To, we're working and with um, potentially also um, former Attorney General Eric Holder is dealing with the, with the same issue, and we're, we're we're looking into partnering with him. But we're currently working on, on a plan to um, distribute distribute to um, the units about redistributing because it's it, it, it's it's it, it's vital and it's important. And just like okay, so let me put this out here. The NAACP is a nonpartisan organization. However, y'all see what the Republicans did. They had a plan and right. they executed it. Right. Yeah. So we need to, um, and, we're, and we're working on it. We're working on um, executing that plan. But we are working with um, an organization at, um, at Yale, Yale Law School. And we will be um, rolling that out to the different units because we know OGC needs your help. Is there anything that we can do on the ground here prior to that to help? That actually is coming, I, I, I keep using the word October, but in October, that, that's, we're supposed to roll, roll that out. So it's, you know, we're hopeful in the next few weeks um, to um, start talking about that. We have oh, yeah. that Emma president is all about that. He so he, is. He absolutely <coughs> is. Did I see our hands, Mr. Kevin? Yeah, I just wanted to share another do before you move on to Certainly, thank you. another area. And this ties into something that President Sweeper was talking about, about being time. Well, I think it may be Attorney Lohar talking about being time. And when you're in a legal redress chair, 50% of the time people come in and they've got a complaint that may be criminal in nature. It may already be in the process of adjudication. They may already have an attorney. And sometimes out of compassion, we don't want to tell people that this is not the place where we can provide you help. So we try to say, hey, you know what? We'll look into it. We'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. you you've got to be honest with people. Right. Mm -hmm. Right up front. Right. Because if you lead people to believe that there might be something you can do, even when you know there's not, mm -hmm. they might stop looking for the remedies that they need outside of you right. and wait. And that waiting can cause them some harm and some injury if they miss some of those timelines and windows. So if you know that this is a criminal case, they've got an attorney, and this needs to go through the courts, don't, don't play with people. Let them know right off the bat. If this is not something that we do, let them know that it's not something that we do right off the bat. Very good point, Kevin. Thank you. I think I saw another hand, sir. I had one do that very important to me, and we should keep good files. Right. Yes, absolutely. People have a habit of looking under their car seat for some paperwork and things like that, but we need to know where it's at and have access to it. Right. Try to have it in some kind of chronological order. Absolutely. Did everyone hear that? Yes. The importance of keeping files. Mr. Kevin? And I just wanted to, about the chronological order thing, um, we used to insist that when people brought a complaint that they gave you that complaint in writing. And there's a reason for that, right? because if you let people come in and they're just angry, mm -hmm. they lose the chronology, and they start telling you the story in the order of what made them the most angry. Right. And you can sit there for two hours, and when they finish, you still don't know what happened. Right. Right. So make sure that you are getting it in writing. Now, Kevin is absolutely correct, and there's another reason that's important to get things in writing, is that sometimes, you know, your memory fades, and so, you know, the closer you are to a situation, the more details you'll have, and so you can always refresh your recollection. But for example, um, I've seen uh, witnesses who, when you ask them, you know, maybe two months after a situation, what happened, and they'll recite it to me, but they won't have remembered everything that they right. said when they first came in. Right. So it is important, it, it is important to have your complainant um, have it in writing, put the complaints in writing. So I'm skipping around a little bit just to make sure I cover as much as I can. Um, in terms of direct action, um, it's important to obtain any and all required permits. And of course, we already know that they should be nonviolent in nature. Um, one of the um, 
request that OGC um, wanted me to, to talk about is that their, um, their thought that the NAACP should have you know, complete control over direct action. And that's, that is a goal. That is a good, exactly. Um, there are times where we partner. We may partner with, for example, Black Lives Matter, or we may partner with another civil rights organization, but it's important um, for us to, as much as we can, have control, the NAACP have control over that direct action. And it's also important that all participants sign a waiver. We don't want to get sued, just in case stuff goes down. So it's important. And if possible, I believe the unit, you know, one of the things that we look at is whether the unit has passed a resolution um, approving, approving the action. Just for clarity, yes. when you say all participants, and you speak of different organizations. No, I'm sorry. Our folks, if, oh. if, if they're if our folks, because we, we can't uh, expect, for example, others that join, join uh, you know, the direct action to sign the waiver. It would be great if they, if they did, but if they're, not, if they're not with us, you know. For example, I don't know if some of the Black Lives Matter would say, okay, I'll sign, I'll sign on to this waiver. These are, these are anyone that we're working with in, in this direct action. And, and the other key piece is because we do partner with Black Lives Matter and et cetera, and if we heard from our panel on yesterday, uh, people have a lot of energy, and, and we talked about different and ad advocating and agitating. And mm -hmm. some people, all they're interested in is the agitation mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. But what we got to make sure is that they understand. And that's why we got to lead you. If, if there is a, uh, a direct action, we got to be leading. We got to be in charge. Mm -hmm. We got to have our own marshals and et cetera to make sure people stay in line, to make sure you know that, that, that you are not trying to, uh, that's why we say don't do kind of protest. You're not trying to agitate the other, other group. Because the bottom line is, it's the five letters that will get sued. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important. I have a question. You know, what, what are the possibilities of getting sued? That's what I need to talk about getting sued. What are the possibilities of getting sued? Either it's personal or either the branch or either the state or the national? Um, in, in, you know, I was going to say every every oh, oh, you can you can get sued oh, personally. You can you can get sued in, in the, your capacity as an NAACP member. The association can be sued. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Well, I had two situations. I think I spoke to you somebody in the office about a month ago about a young lady. She uh she got thrown out of her apartment and um uh, and she called me instead of calling president of the branch, she called me and I called the president of America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then she said, she asked me, uh, then she told me, she, they told her a month ago to, to get out. Mm -hmm. But she waited till the day and then somebody out of the office told me that it wasn't enough time to fool with it. But I told, told the, told the, uh, the, uh, the guy to, to bring it to talk to her. But in a other what I'm not trying to say is she's still in the apartment. The information I got that I told about the NWCP, he said, well, I don't be bothered with people, so she should do that. I'm not sure. He was going to be evicted. Okay, they got it. Okay. They got it. Okay. They know he has read it. I wouldn't remember that story. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Probably. Probably. Yeah, my name is Janelle. I would remember an eviction story. Yeah. yeah, and I would I would also remember Tennessee because my son's here. Yeah. But um, no, I, no, we didn't speak about that. But um, was your point that Keela gave you good advice, or what was the point? Well, uh, Ellis, but the point is that um, she waited too long, too long to tell anybody about the situation. Right? Got it. And uh, she thought it was just doing like that. Oh, yeah. oh, got it. Yeah. Got it, that's, that's correct. And you know, it's interesting because there are times when, you know, our hands are tied when people come to us and then they get angry with us. Right. Uh, I'm not talking about, um, you know, what happened to me and so you say, well, when is this happening to you? And it's like, I'm going to court this afternoon. So, 
we can't help them if they say, well, you know, as you said, I'm cool with NWC. Well, yeah, who, who do you, you what, 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 what can we do? <laughs> but I tend to, but I tend to say, you know, we don't, we don't let that deter us from who we are and what we do. Right. But, um, but I, I, I understand your position, but it, we didn't speak, I'm sorry, but I, I would have remembered that story. Yeah. But I'm sure she would give you great advice, so I'm sure she did. Um, getting back to um, uh, direct action, um, has anyone ever been in a situation where there's civil dis disturbance? Does anyone want to talk about that? or? Okay, so let me let me give you an example. So I keep mentioning Cleveland because it's just in my mind. But uh, uh, as you all know, um, Tamir Rice, um, the 12-year-old um, young man who was, in my mind, murdered right. by the police. Right. Right. Um, that's the young boy who was playing with a gun, a, a toy gun, rather, um, in the parking lot, and you know, police rolled up, and less than a minute later, he was dead. Tamir was dead. There was a peaceful protest that was um, organized. And I don't believe it was organized by the NAACP, but I, I, I don't recall. But in any event, it was, it was peaceful. It was uh, organized by a group. Another group got involved, and it became, uh, it became not a peaceful protest. Right, right, right. So when we're in that situation, can anyone, what, what do we do? What if this were the NAACP, you know, what, what, what do we do? Does anyone have any, any thoughts about other than you know breaking out if you can, getting away from it. You know, what what do we do? I just think we need to retreat if it becomes violent. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah. Attorney Laura, the the first protest that I attended when I came to Region Five because I came out of Region Four was for Ariston Waiters in Union City, Georgia. It was a protest, peaceful protest, organized by the Georgia State Conference. There were uh, probably five or 600 people there. Towards the end, we saw a group of folks who came out of cars. They had masks on their face already. They approached the protest with masks on their face. Um, then President Ed DuBose went ahead, had the, had the march and the rally. When the rally was over, right, those folks who were out there with the masks on went up and down the street. They broke windows out. They knocked signs down. They spray painted on the police department. And then when the news wrote about the protest the next day, even though the protest had been totally peaceful, except for these folks who came at the end, and all of the stuff they did was after the protest was over, when it was written about in the newspaper, it was the NAACP right. had uh, a riot. Right. That ended in vandalism. You know, so one of the things we've got to do a really, we, we've got to be very vigilant about how we marshal, about how we identify, you know, people who are sketchy or potentially bad actors, how we coordinate with law enforcement when we're having a rally, because we have to be responsible for everything from the start all the way to the last person gets in their car. Absolutely. Kevin is right. In the event that a peaceful protest turns violent, here's some of the steps that, the, that OGC is recommending. Okay. Immediately retreat if you can. Sometimes you can't retreat because you're, you're, you're surrounded and you may be surrounded by the police and you, you can't retreat. But to the extent that you can, retreat. Um, provide safe assistance to prevent the loss of life and property. Provides, provide solace, consolation, and support to any victims and members of the family. Immediately assist in obtaining legal representation just in case you are arrested because you are put in the same net as the others who are acting in a violent manner. And this is really important. This goes to Kevin's point. So publicly, issue condemnation of any violation of law, publicly state that NAACP is not involved in this. Um, also, publicly uh, condemn any violations of law, whether, whether they're committed by the police or citizens, because some of the violations of law are committed by police. Okay. May I, may I ask a question about that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I thank the gentleman for sharing that with us. But everything he has indicated, we didn't have anything to do with it. 
that was a separate group apart from uh, the NAACP, even though we were blamed for it. Right, right. And I, I, I guess in the preliminary to ensure that that does not happen again, is the pre-work. See, none of us would have ever anticipated that something like that would happen. Right. But now that we have, he has shared that story right. in our preliminary planning, right. what that means in that particular instance, you got to talk to the news to tell them. Right. That that's, a very, other that's a very, very good point. That's what I was saying, to publicize, to publicize right. that you're not a part of it. And sometimes even when you do all the, the best of intentions with your pre-work, then some people that you could never have anticipated, you know, um, join join in with the group and um, you know create heaven. It is very important that we immediately get out front of this and condemn it, right. and raise our hand and say, "This is not us. Right. This is not what we stand for. Right. We condemn it." And I think that's the best that you can do. The young people, um, I had the good fortune of, of sitting in the. Young, uh, young, young, I uh, used the young oh. adult department yesterday. They had an excellent, excellent, and you perhaps are familiar with it, where you give scenarios and electronically they would tell what they would do in each one of those. Mm -hmm. And then each, someone volunteers in each of the groups for each of the answers. Why would you do that and so? That was excellent. It's wonderful. And, and, and it was. So I was so proud of those young people because those who may have been radical in thought, which were very few, mm -hmm. once they heard the explanation and were asked that you got to think of the pros and the cons and the ultimate outcome before you make a decision. Right. And what those kids learned last night, not only will help them to be more effective NAACP members, mm -hmm. but it's going to affect them in how they make decisions in life. You don't always go for the first thing that comes to your mind. Mm -hmm. Analyze it. It was a superb workshop. That's it's wonderful. Fun. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm very proud of the younger members of this association. So I'm going to just quickly breeze through. Um, um, One question. Oh, sorry, man. Can you address the issue of conflict of interest uh, regarding what specific issue? Oh. We had a situation where uh, there was approval that was given to uh, for participation in something, but then at the end of the day, the uh, they were like the committee was said there was non-disclosure. So, but since we all knew, I don't understand. Explain non-disclosure. Maybe that's what. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure I understand. You're, I can you're talk to you later. Yeah, that sounds like that sounds like a personal. Yeah, that personal that sounds like a, yeah let, let's talk offline about that. Um, have you involved Kevin in this? No, we no? talked. Though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll, we'll talk offline. I'll I'll be here. Um, I spoke to you previously about speaking to the media. Um, sometimes that's something that we do um, to um, help publicize a case that that, that that we're dealing with or some upcoming litigation. It's very, very, very important to stick to the facts. Right. Don't characterize um, the actor. You speak to the action. Right. Does that make sense? It does. So um, I'm going to give you two different scenarios. So um, which of the two scenarios do you think it's more prudent um, to say to a reporter? Um, scenario one, Corporation X's policies have a detrimental effect on people of color. Or um, example two, Corporation X is racist. So for the, those who think that, who, those who agree with scenario, that scenario one is a better, let me see, uh, um, yeah, I'm dealing with uh, very, very smart people. So yeah, so and the reason why we do that is because we don't want to get sued. We don't want to get sued. And it also, it detracts from your message. Right. When you get caught up in you know, um, labeling or name calling, right. it detracts from the, uh, the underlying um, message. Um, and, and one of the other things, um, 
is sometimes we need to say it appears. Right, 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 right. Uh, Because, you know, that, that's saying that from your lens where you're looking, right. it appears that that was going on. That might right. not pan yeah. out to be true, but that's what it right. appears to be. Right, it appears to be. But it's always, a, it's always advisable to, you know, even though you, in, in my mind, again, this is nonpartisan, and this is just Jeanette Warren saying this, um, some of the stuff that's going on in the White House, to me, looks very racist, right? right? right. It's just, it's just, it is. Again, this is not the <laughs> viewpoint of the NAACP, Office of General Counsel. However, for me to go out there and say, Donald Trump is racist, which actually I believe, but for me to go out there and, and say that, that detracts, it's like, you know, um, Deputy General Counsel calls Donald Trump racist. That's the story. Right. The real story are that his policies are detrimental right. to people of color. Right. And that's what I want you to get at. Yeah. And so, yeah. do, do you see the distinction? Right, right. Sir? Yeah. 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 Sorry? You make that statement, you haven't proven that he's racist. Yeah. Right. Right, and, and also, you, what will happen is that people will lose the actual intent of our message. It's right. sensational to call someone, it's sensationalism to right. call someone racist. And, and, and right. you know, again, you want, to hear your message. you want them to hear what the message is, because right. we want to attack the policies. We, we don't really care about the man. We want right. him to stop doing what he's doing, and we want to show that what he's doing is detrimental to us. Right. So if people get caught up in the fact that quote unquote name calling, then all the rest gets lost in the sauce, as my brother would say. And so um, why are we very careful about characterizing people? So the first word is defamation. Right. So let me give you all the legal um, uh, definition of defamation. The act of communicating a false statement against the person that can injure the reputation of the person. Now, you know, I don't necessarily think what I said about Trump or anyone else is false, but I haven't proven it. Right. So that person can say, hey, you have been, you've injured my reputation, right. you've injured my business, and they can sue me. Mm -hmm. Defamation. Another word I'd like you all to be familiar with is slander. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you the definition of slander. Oral defamation, defamation, in which someone tells one or more persons an untruth about another, which untruth will harm the reputation of the person defamed. Slander is a civil wrong tort that can be the basis of a lawsuit. And, and Attorney uh, Lamar, let, let, me, let me put this caveat in. Uh, even when the very prudent to not say that. Right, and, right. and you know, we're dealing with people's lives, their livelihood, their reputations. Mm -hmm. And for us to characterize, even if we believe it, if we even don't if we know it. Even, because, yeah, you know, because, yeah. you know, when I see it was this much money and now it's that much. Yeah. I mean, you know the person that yeah. thank you. Right. I know you are thief. Right. Right. But right. but I have been told before right. if we did not take on the court Right. If, if you know, if we didn't get the litigation against them, right. then you know we, we don't need to say it. Absolute, absolute, absolutely. And even if, for example, say we know it to be true or we believe it to be true, and we go out, we say this, and the person then sues us, even if what we believe is hundred percent accurate, a judge may disagree. Right. And guess what? you know, then we're on the hook. Right. So it is very, very important. You know, what I, what I say um, is, unless you have a thousand percent proof that someone is doing something, you can't characterize it. You can't, I wouldn't advise any one of you to characterize that person as a thief or, 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 or et cetera. Um, because again, um, we don't want to be involved in that kind of litigation, if, if possible. And I just have one more, and then I'll get to you. This one more word is libel. 
Libel is the method of defamation expressed by print, writing, pictures, signs, effigies, or any communication embodied in physical form that is injurious to a person's reputation, exposes a person to public hatred, contempt, or ridicule, or injures a person in his or her business or profession. So it's just really, I'm, I'm trying to underscore the fact that we have to be very, very careful about characterizing people um, in ways that may be injurious to their reputation. And um, particularly when we're dealing with public figures, um, if, we're, if we're gonna come for a public figure, we have to make sure that we are a thousand percent correct in what we're doing, that we're a thousand percent accurate. But more than that, we have to say, really what's the message we want? Is the message that this person is X, we would describe them as you know, a terrible person, or is the message we wanna stop this kind of behavior. We want this kind of conduct to stop because it is injurious to our people. So um, I hope that 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 um, I've made that point. And I saw a hand, sir. Yeah. And you, you, yeah. Okay. Uh, aside from the legal liability, we, uh, the NAACP, as a civil rights organization, should be perceived as neutral and diplomatic. For instance. If there are complaints against a corporation, and you go out and say this corporation is discriminating against its employees, that's a bridge part. The corporation automatically goes into the defense mode. Okay, so and your ability to negotiate has been compromised. If you go in and say, well, allegations have been made that there may be some inappropriate conduct. That's more palatable to the corporation. Because what you want at the end of the day is you want to be the moral conscious to say to the corporation, we need you as a good corporate community citizen. Right. And we want you to be a leader to show these other companies the right way to do these things. But if you go in and burn bridges at the outset, you lose the ability to use that company as an ally in future projects. And so aside from the legal liability, I think diplomacy mm -hmm. always pays off more in the long run than going in with a strong statement. It may be sensational, and it may get you on the 6 o'clock news, but two weeks later, That's right. you have lost an important ally that could be a leverage for another corporation <coughs> that you're having problems with. That's right. Wrong. That's an excellent point. And, all, and then also, <laughs> With, with respect to the corporation, um, I think they would be more willing to work with you if you say, hey, we think there's a, there could be a problem here. We'd like to work with you to see what we could do. And some, some people or some corporations, they just don't care. They, they just don't care. And if that's the case, that's the case. There's nothing you could do. But I think more often than not, um, there are a lot of people that look like us that are in positions of power in those corporations. And um, for us to try to come to the table, there, there's a lot more leverage now because, quite frankly, there's some of us that are at the table. Right. Sir? One thing I could say that we often learn to use is the word alleged. Yeah. When you say yeah. alleged, yeah. that can create everything. Right. Alleged this, alleged that, that can work in anything that you choose to say. Alleged. That means you're not, you just. Uh, giving them to say, I heard this, but you said the latest. <laughs> right, alleged, alleged is a very good word. Um, I still don't want you all to say thus and such is an alleged racist. No. I would rather you all, I would rather you all say, this corporation is engaged in conduct that we are concerned yes that could, is detrimentally affecting yeah. people of color. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing, but a little bit different. Um, I'll get to you, Kevin. Let's speak. Let me see, uh, uh, let, let me say this. I know you're about to run a uh, wrap up then. But the other thing I, I want to say to the units, I think I've said it again, 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 we don't always want to publicize on the six o'clock news is what we're trying to do. Right. Often, if we, often if we tell the world of what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. uh, it compromises our ability to accomplish our goals. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, I mean, figure out something else to get you in the news. <laughs> and uh, 
you that that issue that you're working on. Hold off on it, and you, and you know, and and everything that uh, I'll say again with that being said, uh, everything that's wrong is not discriminatory. Protection in the organization to help us deal with staying clear of the defamation, the libel, and the slander uh, accusations. All of us who work in, um, in in this area, you are supposed to run all of these complaints that come in through the appropriate committee. Do not allow people to come to your general membership meeting and give off complaints from the podium to the general membership. We always cover that. Right. Right. Just, it, it needs to go to legal retreat, but I know that we got branches who they use that as the speaker. And I have the person come in and share a complaint with an open room full of people, and you don't even know who all those people are. And all you need is those people to go out and start repeating stuff and mischaracterize something, and then you have opened up the branch and the association to uh, defamation or liability. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm going to wrap up now, but um, I, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, I didn't see you. Do you need, do you need a, a microphone, sir? Let me, let me say that I really appreciate the information that we have given and received, and I hope we will act on the spirit of the presenter. Thank you, sir. If we have an NAACP, we are still committed structure. And one of those committees that has been a part of this organization has been a religious affairs committee. And I think if we hear from anywhere, it'll be from the pulpits to teach us what togetherness and love means. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to get up the hill as we are climbing, mm -hmm. we're going to have to put things together as a team. And if our pastors, ministers, or whatever they, we come to the public in whatever matter, we're going to have to have the structures to get it back. So when people want to say, I want to do this and so many months and so forth, we won't have to worry about 2018 as much as we are. Mm -hmm. If we were to address it systematically and recognize that freedom is the law of the land. Mm -hmm. If we're going to have people come and tell us that, let's get together without arguing <laughs> and condemning. If we get out and vote, <laughs> then people will know that we're condemning. We don't have to have as many as, as news conferences that become so deranged because we have not done the work. And it will require us to work together. Thank you, sir. I, I, that, was, that was an eloquent and perfect way to end this presentation. And thank you so much, sir. And thank you. I think I went on a little while, but thank you so much. And I, I will, um, hopefully, the Legal Readers Manual will be in, in everyone's hand in October. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to come in to listen. Thank you. Thank you.